This episode is sponsored by our Patreon subscribers. Thank you so much for your continued support. If you're not a member yet, you can join our Patreon for as low as $1 per month to support the cast and crew of The Bardic College. Unlock bonus content featuring your favorite players, get exclusive access to shows you can't find anywhere else, and even get a chance to have Raz run a game of your choice. Visit us online at patreon.com slash thebardiccollege. Hello, my name is Lauren, but you probably know me as Catherine Ross. I'm here to let you know that if you love our content and want to feel the same dread, terror, and jubilation that I do, then make sure to check out Lurking Fears when you head out to your next convention. With a great group of professional storytellers, Lurking Fears is able to weave stories that will haunt you and take you to the very edge of madness, which is something I know a little bit about. Now, while specializing in Call of Cthulhu, Lurking Fears also runs games from a variety of other systems. So there's something for everyone. They're committed to running heavy RPG adventures that are driven by the narrative and, of course, by the player's choices. So check out their Facebook page and follow them to keep on top of which con they'll be hosting games at next. Trust me, you will not be disappointed. Now, let's get back to the action and see what our Keeper Raz has in store for us. But if history has taught us anything, probably going to be bad news. You're listening to a 7th edition Call of Cthulhu podcast titled Cthulhu in Cairo, brought to you by the Bardic College. Please remember to like, share, and subscribe to the show to receive notifications as our future episodes release. You can visit us on Facebook at the Bardic College. Viewer discretion is advised. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Cthulhu in Cairo. And I am Raz, joined by the entire team on mic at one time again. So RL has pushed us all over the place, and so has the story. We are on three separate continents tonight but we're hoping to pull everybody back together and get back onto the main story here real soon. We did have some things that needed to be cleared up, loose ends. Vadim is in Portugal. He's been fortunate enough to find his children. Uh, They are, his young son ran off in a little bit of a 14-year-old fit, but his daughter Anna has arrived uh, with Franco Alvarez's girlfriend. They are standing outside of a cafe, not far from the warehouse district. And as you may remember, that's when the machine gun went off. The girls are in New York. Ella had done a reading with Catherine's aid and assistance on the sarcophagus. Uh, unfortunately, she did not roll great, but she was able to come up with some things, but believes that there's quite a bit of mixed imagery in there. And, uh, you know, we've got that all set up. When this episode goes live, we'll post the entire imagery up there for you. You can read along with her, but um, because it was a lot of little different clues. And as time goes by, you'll be able to figure out, just like our players, which ones were real and which ones weren't. And finally, Jack. Jack Cavendish and Anya and Lakshitha are heading for Africa to meet up with his game warden and uh, the guy who runs his game reserve while he's away, Kakayangu, uh, old time friends. And we're going to be dealing with the girls being set up there in Africa and see what happens. So let's go back to Vodham. Shots ring out. Yeah. And a woman hits the ground. Uh, two women were hit. One, you could tell right away it was really bad. I mean, she was she was tossed around in that classic Hollywood machine gun hit dance where you just keep rocking. And there was one gentleman. Uh, but against the wall and sliding down, smearing blood along the back of the wall of this uh, this hot house, two doors down from where you and your daughter were just getting together, is Gustav, and he has been hit multiple times. As as Franco was walking towards the cab to uh, to to meet Anya, his girlfriend, and and Anna, my daughter, I was kind of standing back a little bit. I think is what I what I have a, a sense there. Taking everything in, just uh, number one, shots fired out. I think they're coming at me. I'm relieved and surprised that they are not, but then immediately horrified to see Gustav slumping against the wall in blood. So I think my first instinct is I run towards the cab that Anya and Anna were getting out of, and I grab Franco, and I start shoving them into the cab. And I say I say to Franco, get them out of here. This is... Get, get them get them to safety. Yeah, well, I'll meet you back at the warehouse uh, later today or tomorrow. Uh, I'll get them out of here. Go. Give me your your address quickly. And he reads off to you an, a, a street uh, not far from here about, you know, um, maybe somewhere uptown. You, you're not familiar enough with Portugal to know exactly, but he tells you the district, the barria, and he tells you the, the name of the street. Enough uh, enough of the uh, the address where I could find him after this. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I, I kind of, you know, go, go, and, sh- and, and shut the door. Okay. I quickly take out my little notebook, and I 
you know, I, my, my stubby little pencil I keep and I jot down the address just to make sure I don't, uh, I don't forget it and all of the freneticness. And then I run over to where Gustav was. I'm, I'm kind of, as I'm running over there, I'm, I'm using all of my abilities to sort of survey the street. Do I see any of the shooters? Do I see anybody looking suspicious? Is it just chaotic? It's chaotic. The car, the car sped away once the shots rang out. Okay, so the shots did come from another car. Yeah, okay. it was a black sedan that 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 screeched tires and then just opened up with you know a burst of twenty or thirty rounds. And do I off. have a uh, do I have a a memory of the sedan? Any details about it? Go ahead and make 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 me a roll. Spot hidden. Um, spot hidden. If you're looking for somebody, you're looking for details. So it's no is education and idea is intelligence. So unless you, yeah, go ahead and give me that one. That's a 67. So it's a regular success. Okay. So yeah, you, um, you can get a make and model out of it. The, uh, you know, it's, it's a fairly more recent car last year or two. It's a Mercedes. Black Mercedes. Yep. I, I, you know, kind of gathering this information as, as as I'm rushing over, seeing that it looks like the, that there's no immediate danger. I run right to Gustav. I'm I'm pulling out my, you know, like handkerchiefs and such, seeing if they're, you know, being ready to like, you know, blot any wounds or possibility. I'm not sure what his condition is. Yeah. Uh, go ahead and make me. Do you have first aid or medical? I have first aid. OK, go ahead and make me a first aid. We'll see what we get. That's 21. My first aid is not great, but that is a regular success. OK, so no, that's that's fine. You're able to get to him without medical. He's he's just going out fast uh-huh there, there's just too many holes too many bullets he's been hit too many times yeah he's just he's just wrecked um he does reach into his pocket and pull out a piece of paper and his hands trembling as he tries to hand it to you i i kind of enclose his hand in mine taking the piece of paper not obviously and i lean in close to him and i'm like you know is there anything you need to tell me gustav what must i do number to uh, to switchboard G- get her home get her home and he dies he passes i uh i he's he's struggling every instinct he does not want to leave gustav but every instinct of his tells him that he needs to get away and distance himself from him right now Oh, absolutely! You're you're already starting to you're already starting to hear a siren. Yep, crowds, people looking on. Oh yeah, yeah, that much noise, that much hitting. Your instinct is to bolt. And um, so I, I, you know, with my ability that I've done a thousand times, I kind of gather up my coat around my my you know around my neck, and I just sort of melt back into the into the crowd. I don't say anything out loud. I don't want you know. Russian Russian accent and Spain stands out. So um, I'm not looking anybody in the eye. I'm not saying any words. Um, I'm just kind of melting back into the crowd as much as possible and finding an opportunity to duck into a side street and make my way away from here. Now you do you you just so you remember it. I'm I'm not sure that's going to change anything, and I understand if it doesn't. There was one woman hit hard, one injured, another man who was kind of shot, but. He looked okay, and then Gustav. Are you trying? To, you're not trying to stabilize the other two. You're just going. You're getting. You're just getting out of here, right? Correct. I think with uh, the more attention I draw to myself, with authorities on their way, it's best that I that I make my exit. Adam, you you steal away into the um into the crowd, and just go ahead and give me a stealth check. I know you're super good at it, but just in case we get a complication. Um, okay. So that is an 88 and a 68, not fantastic, but the 68 is a regular success. All right. So you, yeah, you're able to, you're able to blend in without anybody going, you know, that's the guy over there with the blood on his shirt. Yeah. You know, when you were helping good stuff, but yeah, so you're, you're able to make your, your, your way around and, uh, to get out. I get away from there and then I, um, you know, try to find like a local market or something like that and, you know, um, have the address and see if I can get directions on how to find this location that uh, Franco was going to. Yeah. So the barilla that he's talking about is uh, up off of, so the warehouse sits right at sea level, right? And then, as I had said last episode, Lisbon is kind of, it mimics Rome and the fact that it was built on almost, they they call it the 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 second city of seven hills. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The seven hills. So it does have a lot of ups and downs, sort of like a San Francisco to it. But the one barilla is uh, that, that they indicated is, is further into the the hills district. Uh, So you have to take that. There's stairs. 
right? Just like in when you're trying to get into Montmartre in Paris, it's just stairs. Would it be far enough to, to want to take a cab? Cabs, in, again, in the older section can be tough. You can take a trolley. There's trolleys that go up there. Yeah, no problem. Okay. You can get on one of those. So once you get cleaned up, you, it, you're going you're gonna to just get yourself wiped up, I'm sure, yeah, and all that yeah, stuff. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah, so you can uh, yeah, you can get on a trolley. Now, how long are you giving them to get there? Are you assuming they're going to go right back to the place? What what were you looking to do? Because you could probably make it there in about 25 minutes. This was the this was their residence, right? It's their residence. I, I would head directly there. I would assume that they are heading directly there. Okay. Um, when I when I get a seat on the trolley, I um kind of have a breather. I take a minute to inspect the the paper that Gustav passed to me. Yeah, it's just a, it's just a, a phone number. It's yeah, it's got an international trunk line, but the trunk the trunk is to England, so it's it's first three digits, or if they were two back then, I forget. It's first two its first two digits are England. So it's an international English line, and he said, "Call the switchboard." Call switchboard. Get her home. Mm-hmm. The trolley takes you up. It again. Now it's about. I think we had said it was late. Out, it was starting to get towards late, mid to late afternoon. So we'll say it's like four thirty, five, almost five o'clock by the time you reach the area. So you know businesses are starting to let out, but the but the barilla they live in is not super lavish, but it's nice. And there's there's restaurants and, and cafes, but they're more, far more sporadic than down where you were. Uh, that was there, more of a touristy, you know, area where people will come and go on business during the day. And there's a lot of like the, the warehouses are down there, and businessmen, law offices, and things all gather in that district. So there's you know. A coffee shop, a bar, a, 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 every 30 or 40 feet, you got another restaurant or something. Here, you may have a corner cafe, you may have a corner bar. You do find the the actual address that they gave you. It's to an upstairs ap- apartment. So there's a lower, there's two doors. There's one that is low. And then, you know, one looks like it's, for, you know, has the way this house is shaped. It would be going upstairs because they're close together. The way it indicated on the numbering, it looks like it's the upstairs apartment. I move up there and uh, knock on the door. Okay. Do you look around at all? Yeah, I mean, I'm in this. I'm looking everywhere I'm going. You know, I'm 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 on heightened sense right now. I am hyper aware. Go ahead and give me. Uh, go ahead and give me a spot hidden. That is an eighteen. That is a hard success, not a critical. The upstairs apartment. As you're approaching the door and you're crossing the street, you do see the a hand come and and release. So, like if someone was looking out the window. Okay, probably makes sense. Yep, in the situation, but yeah. Seeing that that's all I see, nothing else suspicious, I do casually make my way up the stairs, just like a, any visitor would, and uh, knock on the door. All righty. 40 seconds go by, little panel in the door, little, you know, like brass panel just kind of opens up, looks out. You see what appears to be Alvarez's face, like, you you know, you're only seeing an eye and a nose, but it, it definitely looks like him. He quickly shuts it, opens the door, and steps back, leaving the door in front of him. So that he's not standing in it in the you know in the in the street looking out like you know where he, anybody driving by would see him. It's just he opens it and lets you in. I hurry my way past him inside and kind of say under my breath, mm, "Lisbon is dangerous city, my friend." Perhaps, but I've that was very strange. Did you? Those kind of things don't happen often. I am I am trusting that that had nothing to do with you or your business. I would Me. hope you would keep danger like that though at the bay so to speak. I was thinking more baby with you. I am a stranger here in town. <laughs> but you come from a place where someone else is already missing. I am Vadim Gavrilov. I may do some smuggling and things, but I have no one that I can think of that would gun me down over it. That's good. Perhaps it was just coincidence then. Wrong place at uh, wrong uh, clock, as they say. Let's uh, let's make an opposed... What's your fast talk persuade? Whichever one's better. Fast talk? Sure. Mm-hmm. All right. What's your... What's your 75. I'm going to go with psychology. That is a 34, which is a hard success. So I rolled 13, but that doesn't beat... What's your... Is your 34 is a hard? Yes, it is. Yeah, it's not going to beat... Uh, that'll beat him. Okay. You're able to convince him. He's willing to uh, just assume that whatever happened was just a freak situation. The fact that the cab happened to pull up with your daughter in it, and then someone gets shot. You know, he's like, uh, "Okay, yeah, he buys along." So, but I, as uh, as we're discussing, you know, there is th- this. This only uh, goes to cover the urgency that uh, that I must get my children to safety. They are all that matters to me now. Of course, of course. Um, what father would do less? Please come up the stairs. 
So yeah, it enters into a foyer of about five by five, four by four, and then uh, just makes its way up a, a sharp, narrow set of staircases like these old buildings had. And then it opens up into an actual, you know, a full size apartment, uh, several bedrooms, nice size living room. And it's well, it's well, you know, it's well outfitted. It's well accrued. And this is where the kids live. The kids live with him. That's what, yes, the kid, the, well, he doesn't live here. This is his girlfriend's house. Oh, okay. And they live with her. Mm-hmm. They live with her. Okay. Do you uh, do you feel confident that uh, that Aslan will return here, given time? Yes. I can't think where else he would go except maybe back to the warehouse. If he was looking specifically for me, if he was looking for Anya, it would be here. Let me ask, as, as our group split up in India, in my little stubby notebook that I, that I jot all my notes down, I'm assuming that there would have been um, information, uh, contact information, uh, for me to be able to reach others in the group. Yeah. Catherine knew that the Cobalt Club was a center, central hub, and she had been left that already by Aveline. So I'm sure that you could have gotten in contact with her. And Jack would be, he gave you the, the address of the, the reserve. The game preserve, okay. which would have to be by telegram. That would be a telegram type thing. Okay. Yeah. So you could reach them if needed. Give me a psychology roll, please. That is a 96. Oh, that's, that's not good. Right. The psychology roll didn't. Yep. Bottom's been trying to keep it together. Well, psychology is, it, you're, it's about noticing the way they're acting. I see. So the, the woman comes out. She's, she's, she's an attractive woman. She's in her late 20s, early 30s. She's an expat. You, you know, she has definitely got that Italian look to her. Dresses well, but not, again, not, oh my God, I'm Capone's girlfriend. You know, more like... I just, I'm in style, I'm in fashion, and I dress well. Especially for, you know, for Lisbon and the, the period of time. Your daughter steps out with her, and the body language that you're getting is very awkward. You're, you're sensing something very off. Now, what it could be, you're not sure, because you rolled a 96, but you're definitely getting the sense that, that something just, she's not clinging to her, she's not trying to be too near her, She's she's not even trying to get like there's no connectivity like, you know, an adult. This is a young girl that lives with a woman. Yeah. And you would think would have her arm on her shoulder like this is your father. There's none of that going on here. This is this is a foreign feeling in this room. Like you're an outsider. You really don't belong here. Who are you? And this girl is just the daughter. is She's like a good four feet away from her. And, and she's not even talking to her. She's talking to Frank to Alvarez. The daughter is. No. Uh, yeah. The girlfriend. So your daughter is kind of just standing there by herself, looking at all the adults, trying to get a gauge of what's going on. Well, as they come into the room, I, you know, I express my concern. I'm like, you know, ladies, are you okay? Everybody is good. There was this violence. Nobody, nobody uh, was hurt. She answers in Portuguese. To, you know, she understands English. She says in Portuguese. And then Alvarez says back there. She's fine. They're fine. Uh, she checked your daughter when she got in the cab. It's, everything's good. She's okay. And I look down at my daughter and I, I try to give her as kind a look as I can with my hands out. And I'm like, and you, uh, you, you beautiful little thing, you must be Anna. She just nods. She says, yes. I, I, and again, her it's Portuguese, but it, you know she's trying to speak English, but she speaks Portuguese pretty fluently. Such unfortunate circumstances to meet this way, Anna. And the older, the woman translates to her and she kind of looks at you and just nods again. Translates into Portuguese? Well, she's, no, she's, you're speaking English. Yes. So, yeah, so she, the girl's English is very, very broken. Like both of them can hear a little bit of it, but it's better for them to speak in Portuguese. So she says to your daughter, He's saying that it's very unfortunate circumstances and your daughter nods at you because her language is for eight years has been Portuguese and just keep them safe. Your wife forbade them from speaking a lot of Russian. They had to learn the language quickly. She retaught them. That's how she was able to stay hidden better. Sensing that Anna's not picking up on everything that I'm saying. Do I do I get a sense that she picks up on some of it, though? I mean, her English is probably like a 15. If that it's probably just what she hears other people say once in a blue moon. It, her Portuguese is fluent. Her Russian's mediocre at best she would have been four so her her base russian wouldn't have been super strong yet anyway it would have been you know but she would remember some russian maybe maybe better I'm than sure english. she remember hello oh no better than english yeah i get down on one knee and in russian i say on a i i am sad to say under such horrible circumstances but i am your father she recognizes the word father 
and she re- she reaches into a little pocket in her skirt and she pulls out a folded piece of like heavy gauge paper and holds it out to you. And what is it? It's a photograph of you. It's the it's what her mother had left. Is it just me? It's just you. And I kind of look at the photograph and I smile as best I can and nod and um and I say uh, again in Russian, yes, it is me. This is me. In Portuguese, she says to the the woman, she makes a comment, and she, Alvarez says, they're asking where Aslan is. They're asking where the boy has gone to. I don't know what to t- Do I tell him that they'll be back, that he's... St- I tell to, to Franco, I, I ask him to explain to them that I had spoken to Aslan at the uh, the warehouse, and he, being upset, had run off. All right. He gives, he passes that information on. By about 7 p.m., he will appear. He will come to the house and make his way in. Do I get any sense that, um, you know, when I speak to her, that there is any, like, acceptance? Um, I mean, I understand she's not going to, you know, necessarily come running up to me and say, Papa, but... um... Right, right, right. You're not getting the same vibe that he had. His vibe seemed more anger. Hers just seems kind of confused. What you are sensing as you sit here longer, though, and, and you're waiting for Aslan... Um, with Alvarez, I'm assuming at some point you're explaining to her that are you waiting for him to show up before telling them they're leaving? Or are you saying to her, listen, we have to go, go start packing. What would you be doing in the interim? Because you have about two and a half hours before he's going to show up. No, I think I want to speak to them together. Oh, okay. All right. So in the interim, um, I try to make small talk in Russian and uh, just sort of make like a light conversational game of it to see what she can recall and um, what little uh, what little memories, you know, she might remember this or she might remember that. Does she remember the, the favorite park that she used to like to play in just to see if there's any, uh, you know, memory connections that I can um, try to make there? Certain key words come, come to her very simply, very easily, you know pretty park maybe a little bit of a stretch but you're able to explain it with paper and pencil you're also able to kind of help yourself along you know i'm sure part of that is frustration you know as a parent you're like i wanted this to be this magical you know giddy up moment and instead it's turned into a, a language barrier that i'm not even you know i'm not a language i even speak but again that that's just part of the, the situation you're in but she seems it's almost as if she seems more resolute more understanding like you're not sure if your wife ever said listen your father's coming you know he'll be here he'll be here he'll be here and as a young girl believing in a father versus a son of 14 when they start to puff their chests a little bit and things start to change she she still saw you as a, she's seeing this as finally i'm getting out of here i'm going somewhere i'm going to be with my father that's what she's hoping because like you said you're waiting to talk to the both he seems a little bit more like well wait a minute i'm already doing stuff um i've got a life here i've got friends where she's you know what i mean it's a little dif- different stages of life in that I try to bring up her mother as much as possible, you know, to, you know, see what information she'll say, you know, what, you know, what relating, you know, memories, things she would say, and, and me the same, because that's our connection. That's, um, you know, the, the love of my wife and the love of her mother is what connects the two of us. So I really try to focus on that. She sends, she says to you in Russian, nothing left. Mother, nothing left. I try to coax a little bit more uh, explanation out of her. She looks over at Alvarez and and Anya, uh, what's her name, Ladini. The two of them are sitting at the table, just having coffee and a and a piece of bread. Just share, you know, that's something that the Portuguese like to do is to dip coffee in bread. And you know, she just says very little, not much. That's all she gets out. She knows you can't understand Portuguese, and she seems like she's not willing to say. She's trying to keep more. it in Russian, right? A- any sort of like insight role? Um, nah, ninety six was what's killing you. Yeah. It's because kill- you're not picking up on all the vibes that she's given off easily. She's fu- she's struggling to say it. I'm wondering if she means like money or something that, you know, her mother would have left for her. Nothing left. I ask her if she has anything of her mother's. Yet nothing left. Nothing left. There's a hole in her stocking at her knee. She's not dressed well. The dress is probably a little shorter than probably it should be. You know, we're not talking Les Miserables with Fontaine and Eponine with, you know, master of the house here. But she's definitely not in the in the best of the to the way the house is versus the way they that they she looks. She doesn't look abused, but she doesn't look like she's cared for like a daughter. She looks like she's, you know. Now, let me let me uh, 
piece some things together. I would assume when my wife Anna came here with them that there would be resources. Anna would be fully aware of everything um, and would be taking care of them in a fashion that uh, the Ian Co. would set them up as. Correct. And when Anna has died, and I still don't really know what happened to her, do I? No. You know, Ying Ko continued to send money, but he said that that stopped a few months ago. Correct. So there is that, but this looks perhaps, you know, more than just a few months worth of a little bit of neglect. So maybe once, maybe once my wife was out of the picture, they've just been using the children as more of a gravy train. Hmm. I mean, it would make sense. That's what, uh, that's what, uh, that's what certain types of people do. Yeah. She does look starved, but she doesn't, you know, she's not. She doesn't look like she's being taken care of by the Kardashians either. You know what I mean? You know, this dress is probably a year or two old. Her coat's a little wear, a little threadbare. And your son was working at 14, not in school. Yeah. So you're starting to put this whole. And again, is it him? Is it her? Is it just the situation? Because they were, you know, they listen, they had two kids dumped on them 14 months ago, right? Uh, they didn't. Is this did they do the best they could? Did they just do enough? That's a tough call. So I would say it's getting close to dinner, right? Oh, no, it's almost seven o'clock before he comes in. Seven thirty. Yeah. So as it's getting a little bit later, I would say to Franco, you know, perhaps uh, you, you would uh, invite me to stay for dinner. Uh, we have more time to talk over food. Words over food always seem to uh, work better. Of course. Let me. Uh, he takes money out and he gives it to uh, to the girlfriend and uh, he sends her across the street, you know, down the street to, to the cafe to pick up enough stuff for, you know, three adults and, and two children. As he sends her out, I, I tell uh, I tell Anna that um, she should sh- she should go clean up. She's able to come up with that when you wash her. You do your hand rub thing and the whole bit. Yep. And I say it in Russian. Being left alone with Franco, I'm like, turn to him and I say, uh, Franco, I, I think it is time for you to tell me what exactly happened to my wife. I told you she got sick. She was... She had the uh, infection, and the doctor said it just it ended up being too much for her. She was she fell ill, bad coughing. Um, eventually, you know, just unable to catch breath. It was very sad. She was uh, a handsome woman. I know that the uh, children have likely been burden for you. I do. Uh, hey, I do appreciate that. I did not think it'd be fair or to them to simply remove them or bring them to orphanage. That, that's not, I, you know, Yinko is a friend. And as I said yesterday, uh, as I said earlier today, it's, he, sometimes we have to go underground, but we resurface. I was just waiting for the resurface to happen. I, I did not expect, sometimes it takes longer than other times when you have to reset or you're pulling your agents back. But this, I, I am glad you are here. I'm sure they'll be better off with you. Um, and I tell him, uh, I am man much like Yinko. I know how to thank my friends and thank them properly. I, f- that is something we want to discuss. We can discuss that. Just trying to um, grease the wheels. Um, I'm not liking the situation here, but with everything that's just happened with Gustav, I don't need to create another enemy or somebody working against me. Um, and he just strikes me. They strike me as greedy people um, and greedy people respond to money. So if they if they see uh, another pot of gold at the end of uh, this rainbow, uh, perhaps they'll be more likely to to help me do what I need to do. I ask him if he has a phone. She has a phone. Would I be able to make private phone call? Phone is in the kitchen. Um, you more than welcome to use it. I guess he'll walk into the living room as long as you're not shouting. It'll be semi private. I mean, he would be able to hear everything you say, of course. Yeah. I um I pull out the slip of paper and I make a phone call to the switchboard. You hear. City. Lisbon. Gustav. Report. Gustav is, has fallen. He gave me number to call. Long pause. Very well. Thank you. I have package, important package to deliver, to finish delivering for Gustav. Do you? A fairly big package? She is, yes. Are you able to bring it? I will do whatever I must. Gustav was honorable man. Do you have access to his last location where he was residing? Our hotel room, yes. We will be in contact there in 12 hours. Everything will be arranged. So, yeah, your son eventually walks back in. 
you know, once the sister's on board, it'll be much easier to convince him Mm -hmm. of what's going on. He's reluctant. I mean, he's a nervous wreck. He's not thrilled about the whole prospect. He feels, you know, this is this is really where he belongs. Obviously, he's not going to be able to fight you on it. He's going to have to go. I mean, he could run again, but Alvarez tells him he's got no place to stay anymore. He kind of jumps in and backs you on that. Basically, the gist of the conversation I want to communicate to both of them is that I'm sorry. That the last thing I ever wanted was to abandon them and not see them for as many years. But that their mother and I both knew that it was the only way that they would ever be safe and could ever have truly have a life. I want them to know that if I had known about what, you know, what had happened to their mother, I would have been here a lot sooner than I am now. And that this has only been to keep them safe, but it has only ever been temporary, even when their mother was alive. And that ultimately the way to keep them safe, they have to come with me. In Russian, he says, we have nothing left. Uh, everything of Mama's is, had to be sold, had to be, had to be given up. I tell him in Russian, money is no longer a concern. But it was her things. A gilded frame from your wedding. Things that w- that never should have left this family. Things that were ours. Oh, God. I've been working just to make sure we can make the rent. Just to make sure I have put, f- I pay for food on the table for, for my sister. This is, th- these are, these people have put a roof over our head, but there has always been a price. I apologize to him. I know that he is, it's been hard. And I tell him that things were never important to his mother. If they were, she would have never married me. That she understood you know that there was a there was a deeper a deeper thing in life the relationships family children love and ultimately that's the only thing that matters that we find that again uh yeah go ahead and give me one more fast talk roll then i'm fast talking the I'm fast talking my son that's it that's it there's no it's no oh gosh <laughs> 96 to a 003 Ouch. That is a critical success on the Jimmy's fast talk. Feet. Yeah, he's already packed. He's ready to go. He's like, you had me at hello. <laughs> you had me at things. Your mother didn't need things. Matter of fact, none of you need things. I asked them to pack their things um, that we're going to uh, go to where I'm staying. I would have gotten some local currency, I think. When I, uh, when I, when I landed, I sort of pull out a wad of local uh, Portuguese currency. And I just sort of press it into the hand of Franco and tell him thank you as we as we leave. And I suppose we would take the trolley down to a place where we could find a cab. Yeah. The um. So the way what we'll do with this is you're able to get out when the kids come out. They each only have one extra outfit of change of clothes. No additional shoes. Just the cloak, the coat that they were wearing. There's, you know, your son had one shirt, one pair of underwear, extra one and one. It was basically like they were just having to, you know, do the wash every night after they wore the stuff, hang it. And then the next day they'd have a fresh set while it dried. Oh, man. If only I didn't want to cause more trouble. This guy. (laughs) I'd be gunning people down in their home. (laughs) Oh, you live high on a hill. That means I could throw you down a hill. Oh, (laughs) my gosh. I am just resisting. You know, I'm like, ah, oh, I don't need more trouble. I have a body I got to try to get out of here. My children's safety I've got to see after. I need this guy thinking that he's off scot-free. Yeah, he's got you in a tough place at the moment. At that the moment. Down the- but down yeah, the road, the <laughs> his name is making it into my little book. Sure would be an unfortunate thing when all of his warehouses burned to the fucking ground. <laughs> oh, did I, I say want- when? <laughs> And outside is just just one shirt folded in front of it. It's not on fire. Just like a pair one of shirt, pants. One pair of pants. I'm gonna. I'm. We're going to the clothing store, and I'm gonna save those clothes. And that's what's gonna be laying in front of the burned down warehouses. <laughs> oh, s- typical Russian response. <laughs> yeah. All right. So yeah, you make it back to the hotel with the kids, and then that situation is good. Um, we'll pick it up when we get back next time with. Uh, the trip to London with Aveline and how we, you know, with the children, they're going to basically the Gustavs are going to arrange it all for you. They'll get you, they'll get you into London. And that's probably a good hub for the others to meet back with you. One last thing, as we get back to the hotel, I want to send a telegram to Jack in Kenya. So go ahead. And do you know what you wanted to say? I wanted to say, uh, I, I um, try to explain that um, I have my kids and I need to know where I can leave them safely. And since he's got two new kids he just brought to the game reserve, 
the Cavendish home for wayward children. It's coming, baby. Jesus. So, <laughs> I thought rich British families took in orphans and wards all the time. This is perfect. No, no, we find places for them. It's completely different, completely different. All right, so that telegraph goes out. So why don't we go over to Jack? Yes, you land in, uh, out, you know, the closest airport to where your, your reserve is is probably, you know, like 80 miles. Yeah, Nairobi. Yeah, I'm guessing it'll be in Nairobi. Yeah, Nairobi. So, and then um, a truck's been sent for you uh, to pick up you and, you know, your just massive amount of guns. And uh, if you telegraphed ahead, like probably you did, you know, that it also, that you had, you know, some guests. We'll say you arrive and it's about 11 a.m. So the sun's just, you know, really up in the sky. Uh, it's, it is the winter time, but it's South, Af- you know, it's Africa. So it's going to be a little bit w- obviously warmer. They're in their summer right now, right? You're in your winter. Yeah, they would be. So Europe's in the winter. They're in their summer. They're close to the equator, I think, was where Kini is, like Central, East Central Africa. The truck, you know, is there. One, it's one of your workers on the on the reserve. Very, very, you know, one of the nice men. It's it's not Kaka uh, Yangu himself, but it's it's somebody that you know he's hired. He's very good, and he's like. Um, Neope, Neope, good to see you, good to see you. Um, all this, all these here, we put in the truck, yes? Yes, all of it in the truck. It's so good to be home. I can I can smell the Kenyan dirt. It's fantastic. It's good to see you. That's good to see you too, Neope. Long ride, three, four hours. Uh, little ones need food? Hungry? Yes. Uh, girls, girls, you, you're hungry, right? Do you, want, do you want to eat something before we go? It's It's going to be a long ride. Yes. Oh, you, you know that in that stereo thing that young children do when they just both right, shout yeah. at the same time and then, you know, start jumping around a little bit. And they're yeah, this is they're in their Napoli's garb, you know, that's it's normally it was January. So they came out in heavy woolen, you know, yak suits made of <laughs> of that really yak lightweight suits. yak fur <laughs> yak fur. Um, are you saying that you saying that we need to stop somewhere in town and find them appropriate clothing? Is that what you're telling me? No, I'm sure sh- I'm sure you have. You know, women on the on the reserve that can get them outfitted for Africans. You know, African. Yeah, women, they'll clothing. send somebody in, they'll measure them, and send somebody in to bring them clothes. But yes, the uh, you're, opens up a, a little trunk, quickly puts a fire. He doesn't expect you to go pay for the food. I mean, that's crazy. He brought some supplies with him, and on the side of the road, he just makes some eggs. He makes an omelet, whips up an omelet or two on the side of the road. Has a canteen, a thermos full of uh, tea in one and water in the other. He just pours them some water. And they, it, to them, it's a massive adventure. Like, oh, my God, you know, we're cooking on the side of the road with a little campfire. And it's a little Cerno type stove that he has, something that would have been, you know, relevant to 1932. Smiling all the time. He's speaking to them in, you know, fairly broken English. Again, they can get through a little bit of English. So that's that's not a problem for them that, you know, because their parents were tour guides. They they were they were taught English early on. Some words they lose, but for the most part, they're able to get through within an hour. You're back in the you know in the truck and they're sitting in the back and they're laughing and having a good time. And are you driving or are you letting him drive? No, I'll let him drive so that I can I can basically tell the girls about the region, about um, the area that we're driving. So you're sitting through. in the back. Yeah, I'll sit with the girls. Like I'll sort of sit between them, so I, I can talk about the Savannah and the Plains game and what life is going to be like. And basically, uh, I guess it'd be a combination of building it up, and also, you know, because I'm someone who loves it and it's where I'm from, I'm sort of sharing a place that you love with them. You know, this will this will be your new home. You know, I'm I'm going to adopt you. I will be your father, and uh, you'll love it here. It'll be wonderful. So the driver's name is Navike, and uh, he's just he's singing, and, and there's no whack window, right? There's just it's a it's an open. Matter of fact, he probably has something where the windshield drops because of the. Yeah, cool. it's probably a Land Rover. Yeah, it's way. probably like a Ford or Land Rover. Yeah, he's singing in you know a, a dialect uh, of the region and having a nice time with it, and the girls are kind of like they're asking all kinds of questions, and fi- within about 15, 20 minutes from the airport, you're already seeing like you know a young elephant. You're you're seeing hyenas running, and the road is. It's barely a path. At times, it's not even a road. It's he's cutting across just massive fields that aren't yours, but are just generally nobody's. They're just large tracts of land. And then he gets, then you know, he just instinctively knows to go east. And then oh, there's the road again. Opens a gate. He's back on something of what looks like a road. Crosses a riverbed. I mean, it, this is just goes on and on and on. And it takes the eighty miles takes you almost four hours to go. So he's he's average. He's cruising probably about fifteen twenty miles an hour as a good speed just because of how bad the roads are. Otherwise, you'd be throwing the kids left and right. By about four o'clock in the afternoon, though, you do arrive at the name of the reserve. So what is actually the name of your place? The name of the, the, name of the reserve is Kubwazi, K-U-B-W-A-W-A-Z-I. It just means wide open land in uh, Mijikenda. So Kubwazi is there. There's a big, I'm sure, you know, want, as a matter of fact, you know what? Let's do it this way. 
take a moment and describe Kubawazi's entrance to me and what people see as they, I mean, because I know the road must be almost like a mile long to get to the, the houses and stuff, but what do they see as they enter? Is there a, is there a big, uh, Gate yeah, fence. well, yeah. There's probably going to be there's probably going to be sort of a uh, semi ceremonial sort of a gate with like uh, stone pillars and then like a sign above it in, in wrought iron that just says uh, Kuba Wazi, um, something that just sort of denotes the reserve. And it would probably be another couple of miles from there to actually get to uh, to the actual houses because it's gonna, it's going to be at the beginning of the beginning of the reserve, which is fairly large. So, but yes, you're right. It's just going to be a track that's going to go through because it it's in the middle, it's in the middle of this wide open, just rolling grassland with shrub trees. I mean, picture any African movie that you've seen with elephants on the savannah and Plains Game and Kudu and Thompson Gazelle, things like that. Listeners. So when we've been doing these names of NPCs and stuff, there were two Anyas along the way. One was Anya in Portugal, who was keeping the kids and there was an Anya in Nepal that was Chorgi's daughter. So we have this Anya is here. So when we say Anya, don't get confused. There are two people in the world named Anya. We just happen to have both of them on the show. So we were very fortunate to get both of them to agree to be a part of the show. Uh, so we have we have the two Anyas and we have uh, the other one is Lakshitha. She's the oldest, I believe. Yes, Lakshitha's 15. So the little one is falling asleep in her lap. She was listening to you talk. And what tends to happen with, a, you know, adults, especially males with a deeper voice, is that they tend to make children kind of just go, and they, especially after an airplane ride and a car ride and hours and hours, they're just overwhelmed. It's just sensory overload to them. And it's warm. It's, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. So there, she's, she's out. But the older one is, is still awake and says some things to you. And she says, can I talk to you, Mr. Jack? Yes, of course, Lakshita. You may, you may say anything to me. Feel free to say anything you wish. Why? W- why what, dear? Why do this for us? You you never climbed with my mother and father. You didn't. You were never there when that lady got shot. You and they came for us to the mountain. That's very true. Why? That's very true. Well, because sometimes bad things happen to good people, and. There are other people in the world who are good and want to do good things and help them. And this is one of those times. Why would I leave you and your sister alone in Nepal with no one in a horrible situation when I could bring you here and share this beautiful world that I come from and give you a future and give you a family that you can call your own and be safe and and be happy and, and grow up to be beautiful women? Why would I not do that? I would be selfish not to. She starts to cry a little bit. She said, people know us our whole lives, called my mother and father friend, but they said nothing once they were gone, did not want to help. And these were these were good people, people my parents trusted to watch us uh, sometimes when they had to go together and we were too young. Women and, and men folk of, of Kathmandu of our city would stay with us or invite us to their home to play with their children. And, and they turned their back. Are, are people from Nepal not good people? No, I, I think in that... It's complicated. Yes, I understand. But, you know, different places in the world act very differently. And what might be very normal where you came from is just not the way people behave where I was raised. Let me tell you a quick story. When I was born, my mother had to go away. And I was very, very young. And I was still a baby. And there was no one to help me and no one to help my father raise me. And so a very good friend of mine named Kakayangu, and he and I were basically raised like brothers. And his mother was not related to my family at all. She was a wonderful Mijikanda woman and uh, a tribeswoman. And she raised me as her own. She was my wet nurse. She took care of me. She treated me as her own son, even though she wet wasn't nursed? my mother. Yes. Well, you know, when, when a small child uh, breastfeeds with its mother, that that's what she did for me because my mother was gone and I still needed to be breastfed. So yes. She, she and, chuckles. Now yes. she gets what you're saying. So, I mean, it is a very different world where she came from too. She came from a very tribal world, a world that was very basic by your standards. And I came from a world that was very different from hers. And yet it didn't stop her from caring very deeply for me and treating me as her own. And I think perhaps in my own way, that wore off on me. And maybe that's why I want to treat you like my children. And I want to adopt you. And I want to be your Uncle Jack and give you a good, good world because I never had children of my own. She says, I, I, I didn't... I didn't think that was something people did f- after the way they treated us. So I am well. I don't know what to say. My my sister and I are are very grateful, Mister Jack. Very grateful. Well, that 
I understand. And it's but here people will treat you very well. They will treat you as if you are my children because you will be my children. And you can call me Mr. Jack or Uncle Jack, or if you wish at some point, you can call me father, if that's what you want. Whatever you want to call me, you call me. But I will treat you as my children and everyone on this reserve and everyone in Kenya and Nairobi will know you as my children and they will treat you with respect and goodness. And if they don't, we'll shoot them. Fabulous. That's what we were waiting for. That was the moment. (laughs) There's a Cthulhu in Cairo. That's Cthulhu in Cairo love right there. And if not, we're going to shoot them or we're going to burn down their warehouse or we're going to, I mean, this is the kind of people, this is the kind of people I run folks. We're just love (laughs) and death. My my kid only had an extra pair of pants. You're, I'm going to burn your business to the ground. <laughs> I'll show you. We're a spiteful group. <laughs> oh my God. You can call me God, Carl. Uh, that's that. There you go. So <laughs> it all, it all comes back. Doesn't it? The NPCs are just a little off center and my group's all over them. So yes, the, uh, she's very, she's overwhelmed. The little one doesn't quite have that same understanding of how she, yeah, bitter. She doesn't understand. Yeah, right. she's not quite there yet. You know, she just saw people passing by and was like, well, why aren't they talking to us? Why wouldn't they help us? Well, the good thing is the young one is young enough that as time goes on, she will adapt much easier than the 15-year-old will. Because the 15-year-old is going to bring so much more of Nepal with her. Whereas the young one, she won't forget Nepal. She won't forget that language. But she will become Kenyan. She will... It will become natural to her. And, and my hope is at least that Lakshitha will be happy and be, and be safe. Believe me, happy isn't happy is not a problem. She's she's there already. It's a it's a good thing. You pull up to the large uh, to the resort. Describe it to me. Is it is it multi tiered, multi leveled? How it, this was the one your father had originally designed, right? Yes, yes. So it, this would have been built in the late eighteen hundreds. It would be uh, there would be one main large sprawling. Uh, house in sort of a ranch style, which is very common to Africa. So it would be a very large, sprawling ranch style with probably multiple, um, multiple fires, you know, uh, fireplaces in it, but a, a gigantic wide porch on the front, you know, like a low slung roof. And then there would be uh, outlying in, in the distance, there would be smaller cottages, numbers of smaller cottages where people would stay when they came to go on safaris and things like, because it's a business. So they right, would like be, bungalows and stuff. yeah, they'd be somewhere between a 10th of a mile to, to a mile away spread out from each other. And there would be tracks back and forth where people would go back and forth to, you know, clean them or, uh, and take care of them and send food out to them and that sort of stuff. So, but yeah, it would have like the house would have our own rooms in it. It would have big common rooms where people could stay and we could have sort of gatherings and things like that. It'd be like a combination of your private home and and sort of a, a public reserve kind of place. So sort of like uh, the great, uh, the um, Animal Kingdom's Lodge. The uh, and the It's just not quite as tall, but the general layout of, you know, a common, big common space. Right. We'd be, it'd be like one level. They're, they're all usually one level with sort of high, high ceiling roofs. So the heat can go up and they have, you know, they have fans in them and things like that. But yeah, this would have been very old because it would have been built in the late 1800s. Yeah. As you, as the truck pulls up and everybody starts to disembark other people that work for the the reserve and, you know, that are housekeeping and and other staff uh, all on the payroll, you know, all people that you've, that you have as part of the, the estate itself uh, come over, they, they greet you, you know. They open, they open, and they're like saying hello to you. And they, they, they unload. A couple of the women are looking at the young girls. They're like, you know, speaking in the language. Now you speak, you speak this this tongue, correct? Mijikenda, yeah, I speak, uh, yeah, I speak Mijikenda. Yep. So they're asking you a lot of questions about the girls. You know, how long are they staying? You know, what rooms do you want them in? Do you want them in the bungalow? Do you want them in the main house? Um, sh- you know, you explain all that, and then you hear a, a deeper booming voice, and it's you recognize it immediately as Kakayangu, and he says. Neope, welcome back. Ah, Kakayangu, my friend. And I run up and I, I go to greet him and give him a huge, a huge manly hug. And he says, friend now or still brother? And he hugs you back. And I, I look at him and I smile very broadly and I say, brothers until we are dead. <laughs> and may that be many, many days from now. I got your telegraph. These are the, the young ladies you bring from, from the faraway mountains of Nepal. I looked on map. It's very far. It is another world, my friend. It is very cold there and, and very, very beautiful, but very forbidding. Very forbidding. I much prefer Kenya, though I do love to travel. This is, and I turn around and I, I say, this is little Anya and then this is Lakshitha. These two wonderful girls 
are going to stay with us and I'm going to adopt them. They will be my daughters and they will be treated as if they are my family and you will treat them as you are their uncle because you are my brother. So he greets them in, 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 in English as well. And he asks them, you know, he asks a little bit about their culture and he says things like, you know, tell me where you're from. And they say, oh, the mountains. And he points way the hell off in the distance, right? <laughs> and there's there's a mountain over there. And he's like, like that? And they all ju- they just giggle. They're like, no, no, not like that one. And then they point way up. They go like up like that. And he's he's like, he, he can't imagine that kind of like the way they're explaining it. It's, you know, it's a different type of, of different type of landscape. And and they're just, you know, they live on the side of a hill and, and they kind of are like, you know, our house is is built on, you know, a steep ledge and Kathmandu and it overlooks a cliff. And they're like, what? He, so he laughs with them and he all, the women are gathering around. They start to take them inside. Um, he says, uh, Naope, before we get the girls, I'll, I'll let the women take them in. Um, we've had poachers again and I've been forced to scare them off, but they are definitely becoming far more aggressive, far more. They're taking far more chances. Have you talked to the rangers about this? Are they doing anything about it? I uh, asked the gods of, of, of the earth and the soil to, to take what I say and and have it only for your ears. But it would not surprise me if some of them are accepting. Times are tough, Neope. And these men, they don't get paid nearly the amount of time and effort they put into it for what they get. I, I'm afraid that some of them may be taking coin from, from these outsiders to, to take the ivory. Well, we can't have that. I think what we should do once the girls are settled, we should, we should set out and we should uh, go out tonight and uh, go looking for these poachers, try to set a trap. He says, Naope, these girls have just arrived. You, you can't walk out on them tonight. That would be, no, no, you, we must, if I go, I go, and I take several with me, but you must be here. They, this is their first night in a strange land. You can't, you Yes, can't I suppose leave that's true. I just miss home so badly. <laughs> I just want to get the hell out of here. Just start hunting, for God's sake. Do this then. <laughs> take, take seven stout men and arm yourselves for the night. Make camp where you, in the areas where you think they've been and see if you can't set a trap for them. We need to catch them, and we need to make an example of them. If you catch them, drag one of them back to their town dead, and mark him as a poacher, and that this is what happens when they poach on our lands. Okay, I'm going to ask you a question. Um, you've given the instruction. Yeah. Poaching was was a killable offense yeah. in 1932? I just, yeah. okay, okay. Just want to make sure we're talking about the... The same type yeah, of poaching. Yeah, because remember, we're not real we're not talking about a modern game preserve where they're poaching on a preserve. We're talking no, no. about poaching on someone's property. So all of these animals, if they as they wander in and wander out, as they're on my property, they become ours. So they're poaching our property. And I understand about the food and all that sort of stuff, but I do actually employ a ton of them. So yeah, you just sort of have to set an example. You can't have people just one because you're right. There are a lot of very hungry people and they can't see that it's acceptable to then. This is our livelihood. Without these animals, we have no livelihood. Yeah, I, I just want to make sure it's, not, you know, when you when you think of, of taking a life over it, is that is that really the instruction? If that's your instruction. Yeah, that's, that's what fine. they do today. That's still what they do today. They kill poachers over there. They, they, they try to capture them. If they can't capture them, they kill them. And they burn they burn all the tusks and all the stuff that they've they've taken on the spot. Very well. Okay, so he says, uh, "I shall do this, and I will. I, I'll take six or seven of our best. Whatever, whoever is able to go with me tonight will, will definitely come. We'll, 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 if if they are he- if they are here, we will find them. My mother, she sends all her blessings from from the tribe and says that before you go back, you must come and have a meal with us. I cannot wait for the girls to meet her, for them to meet mother. They will love her. They will love her. They will think she is she is the salt of the earth." All right, yeah, so the girls are going to get settled in. Everything, you know, that's not a problem. The day that you arrived would have been another day after Vadim. Yeah, so uh, the Telegraph will be arriving in another day or so. So okay. you have the, uh, the the girls have dinner downstairs. You have this, I'm sure, fairly luxurious, you know, dining room table, something that the English would have appreciated or built of the woods locally, but they would have built it in their style, you know, really long. Yeah, it would probably be yes. like aging Victorian stuff, right? Because they probably would never have gotten rid of it. So it would have been Victorian stuff that has like slowly gotten gotten older and worn in. Yeah. Distressed Victoria, Victorian <laughs> distressed. We call that old. As in we can't afford <laughs> to buy it again. Yeah. So there are several guests uh, at the reserve this evening. Kakiyango didn't actually mention that at first, but as dinner bells... As the dinner chime goes off and the bell goes on outside, several Europeans come in. Nobody that you know, but they they recognize you and because and, and, your picture's hanging up on the wall of the fireplace as the as the owner of the preserve. And uh, you know now all of a sudden 
it's time to be the statesman, right? It's time to to tell them a little bit about your adventures, where you've been, and where the best game game gaming is. And the girls are just fascinated to hear what you you know all the things you tell them about the land and about how long your family's had it and things of that nature. Go ahead and make me a what's your best skill? Uh, persuade. Do you have a good persuade or history? Or persuade is only a ten. My my history is a five. Really? Okay, so. You're a, you're 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 the owner of the reserve. What what skills could you see yourself using to sort of talk to them about the whole experience and why they should be here? Do you have a good knowledge, which is education? What's your education? Um, yeah, my education's an eighty, so I would know the area. I would think that through education, I would know the area very well. Got to make me a roll. Thirty four. Thirty four would be a hard success. So you're basically the star of the evening. Obviously, that's the whole point of you being able to sit with them. And they ask, you know, you know, Kakayangu took us out and we saw some amazing things, but he always says that no one knows the land better than you. Are you able to take us out tomorrow? Will you be going out with us? Yeah, yes, I can take you out tomorrow. As long as we, I want to take the girls with me too, if you don't mind. I have my new wards with me. I'm sure they would love to see the reserve. Would you like to go, girls? Everybody's having a good time. Yes, we can take you out and we can, we can peruse the reserve. We can talk about the many game, uh, some of our adventures, some of the animals that killed the time I, I almost died. And accidentally killed a lion as a small boy. You killed a lion? Accidentally. Mr. Jack, you killed no. Yes. <laughs> Quite accidentally, I assure you. It I'm... was a cub and I ran it over. <laughs> yeah, we, it, it, I, w- I was walking back from, uh, from Kakiyangu's uh, tribe and uh, he and I were talking and it jumped out of the bush at us. It, it wasn't something that was planned. We weren't hunting it. Um, and it merely took my life. And I, I, I hold out a pouch that I had under that has the two eyes in it from the uh, from the from the lions that the witch doctor had saved for me and i said these contain this contains the eyes of the lion that the tribal witch doctor had saved for me to give me second sight like the lion so now if you're bad i will know about it are you talking to the guests or the, the girls the girls and then i wink at the guests <laughs> oh I, th- I thought it was the other way around <laughs> you say that to the guests and then <laughs> wink if you're the bad girls. you die no <laughs> <laughs> I'm sort of entertaining the girls and then sort of winking to the people and then sort of trying telling them at the same time about this sort of these sort of crazy adventures that I had. I show them my right forearm has a, a scar all the way down from my wrist to my elbow. Um, that is from when I was a teenager and I got a little too close to a rhino on the back of a vehicle and it gored, it gored my arm. Uh, things like that. Just amusing stories of growing up on a reserve with my crazy father and uh, and all the people. Yes. So what we'll do is um, we'll pick up in the morning with the situation of Vadim getting his way out of uh, Portugal with the the children and Aveline's body. And we'll also find out more about Jack Cavendish and his ride around his property when next time we get together. Uh, gentlemen, thank you so much. We're going to take the next show and go back to the ladies a little bit, find out what they're, what they're finishing up in New York City. Uh, but from tonight, gentlemen, thanks so much. Appreciate everything you've done. It's, it was an interesting show. Vadim, I know that warehouse thing, we're going to have to come back to that at some point. We'll just make a, maybe we'll do it as a, as a, as a Patreon special, <laughs> the burning of Lisbon, which happened already. The Great Lisbon fires already happened. We don't want to do it again, but the warehouse district, that part. Oh, the up. timing that's doesn't work out? Oh, wow. <laughs> no, it was 1750-something, but that's uh, okay. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, yeah, we'll call no, it the WD. second great burning of Lisbon. Then. <laughs> right. the, the nearly great. The, <laughs> the penultimate <D>. burning. <laughs> but from all of us here at the college and from the gentlemen on the group, uh, thank you so much. We'll talk to everybody next time. Don't forget, like, share, subscribe. Tell all your friends. Join the Patreon if you haven't, because Operation Poltergeist is really starting to cook. It's got uh, people, the, the Patreons that are listening are really enjoying it already. Um, we're going to be putting out some tidbits for you, a little couple teaser trailers in the near future. But um, that's it from us for this time. We'll talk soon, everyone. Good night. Thanks for listening to this episode of Cthulhu in Cairo. You can like, share, and subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts. The music you're listening to is Return of the Mummy by the great Kevin McLeod. Join us next time to see where our intrepid explorers find themselves next.